speakers. John. Oh, is that uh, right? Okay. Yeah, yes. Thanks. Just to give you an idea. That. Yeah. But you are uh, most welcome to speak as long as you like. <laughs> well, thank you. No, that's right. No, like we we got an hour, so I I, got, <laughs> I know there are certain constraints here. So you have uh, fifty minutes. Fifty minutes. I'll get that even <laughs> more so. Right. 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 Um. I, I don't know how to introduce you, John. I was looking at your LinkedIn. You're doing 10 things currently. What's <laughs> what's your favorite one? Well, actually, what we're doing right now really interests me uh, the, the most. Um, is, is, Bioform Labs? Yeah, well, it's Bioform, but this whole project about AI for common good mm -hmm. and be able to mm -hmm. actually create a new architecture for AI that's life, uh, biology-based. Um, I think there's getting a lot of momentum around it, actually. So it's it's, yeah. it's uh, a number of things are converging that makes it most exciting. Yeah, and, definitely. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's 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 my idée fixe right now these days. Okay. I'm working on an actually an essay on this as well, and I just shared it with Tom. Who's good morning, Tom? Good morning, Tom. Right now these days. <laughs> okay. I'm working on an actually yeah, an go. essay. Good morning. On good morning. One thing, uh, uh, as well, Alice and Dependent with Tom. Uh, Pen Pen morning, Tom. Uh, morning, Tom. Limited time to attend, he will lift at okay. Good morning. Good morning. So, Good morning. so Good morning. we will uh invite him to talk uh, after David. Yeah, sure. Okay, so, yeah, sure. because he have to leave soon. Okay, hey, Paul. Morning. Good morning. And Hello to all. Morning. Yes. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> How are you, Paul? I'm fine. Yes, we are in the last uh, tractations of the AI yes. Act. I, I, uh, you, you read the book? Yes. <laughs> yes, I had I a look it. at it. It's fantastic, amazing. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. And so, thank you so much for your writing and contribution to the book. This is a, the book is a from the ideas. <laughs> yes, I think I have to say thank you, grateful for your ideas. Mm -hmm. Your uh, advice and should get help, uh, should have uh, the book, and we make a book and you have a uh, significant writing. And also, uh, I hear you have a uh, house in Rome now. Yes, it's being renovated to get uh, ready for next next year. <laughs> I I I. I I, li I love your Rome also, so I hope to see you in Rome next year at some event. Yeah. So I think we now have people from three different continents. Yes. Oh. US, oh. Europe, Australia. Where else? Yeah. Asia. Um, Asia. Yeah. Asia also. And uh, yes. Four continents. Oh, yep. Uh, came also. Thank you, Kim. I'm here. Thank yes. you, Tom. What wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim. Kim, hi. And uh, Hello, Kim, Kim, please. Uh, Hello, John. Nice to oh, see you. <laughs> Okay, mother, Paul Nemitz, I see. Yes, Kim, how are you? Um, I think I saw friend uh, Scrapenta's uh, name as well. Uh, David, nice you meet you others. David, David, you have to give us a teach in on this um, <clears throat> active inference methodology. <laughs> we'll do that. Yeah, we should have we should have a teach in in some seminars and that is right. Right, it's very well. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good evening, Martin. Nice to see you again. Your microphone is on mute, just so you know, Martin. Okay, I, I think I've opened it. Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon. Hello, David. David. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. So but now I think uh, because uh, Governor Michael Luca Christ maybe cannot join because of Kitty health. So yeah. we will start. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, invite you and uh, 
please uh, set the day April 30 for our big event, uh, all day event yeah. at Harvard Loop House, April 30. Nasdi, my dear, Nasdi. joy already. Hello. Okay, so now, David, uh, love joy, please, uh, you stack for our event now. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, everyone, for being in attendance. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm David Lovejoy, a fellow board member of the Boston Global Forum. A pleasure to be here today with you all. So we are here today to discuss the letter on a natural AI based on the science of computational physics, biology, and neuroscience, policy and societal significance. And here to start off our discussion today is Stanley Cobb, Professor of Psychiatry of the Harvard Medical School, David Silberschweig. Thank you. Thank you, David. Welcome, friends. It's really nice to see all of you today. And thank you, Tuan, as always, for your leadership in bringing us together around important issues. The issue of the day, which in fact, uh, the Boston Global Forum and AI World Society has been addressing even before it became, uh, before it exploded on the scene, uh, is AI. And in particular, an approach that the Boston Global Forum, AI World Society, together with the Active Inference Institute and the Neuropsychiatry and Society program, is putting together to educate and advocate and, and try to uh, shape discussion around the development of AI and to do it in a way that is pro-social rather than anti-social. Um, and I'll describe what that means a bit more in a second. And, um, and therefore is ethical um, as opposed to unethical. And I hopefully shouldn't have to describe what that means. Um, why do we even need to have such a discussion? Well, AI, um, as people on this uh, Google Meet know and have been pioneers in, uh, some of us, the, the potential is enormous. And it is, by the week, astounding us as to the capabilities of artificial intelligence and large language models, um, generative, so-called generative AI, and the ability to apparently think. And I say apparently because we could get into a whole discussion about um, what uh, subjective states are and whether computers could have them or not. That's not the topic of the day, but there's no evidence at present that they uh, that they have them even in the context of AI, although they're very good at mimicking um, and even passing the so-called Turing test uh, in certain regards uh, in terms of seeming as if they, um, uh, they are intelligent. In fact, by many measures, they're intelligent. In some measures, they're more intelligent than we are, uh, the creators of AI, and they're transforming every field and um, and certainly, you know, we don't need to to go into that. Um, people have called uh, out the potential dangers and including the destruction of civilization or humankind. People, other people, sometimes the same people have have talked about the uh, incredible potential of AI, which is already being realized in certain regards in terms of aiding humans, uh, people to do things um, that otherwise they couldn't do or that would take much, much longer. Um, and the issue is how we're going to live with AI. And that is a pressing issue. It's being dealt with now increasingly seriously by governments, by the European Union, uh, sort of in the forefront of this. Uh, and the private sector, academia, not and government need to come together, um, as there has been a call for, to, to really think about how to shepherd these technologies in a way that will 
um, that will benefit people, that will benefit humanity rather than harm humanity. And um, in order to do this, the, the key notion for today's meeting and this whole initiative, joint initiative, is that, um, that it can be beneficial for AI to be developed in the context of uh, an understanding of natural systems, including the human mind brain. Um, AI, in fact, is an evolutionary product, can be seen, if you will, uh, of uh, natural systems in the human mind brain and, uh, as the proximal creator of it, if you will. And the more we place it within and, and have an understanding of um, natural systems and the human mind brain, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to have an AI that will um resonate with that will work cooperatively with um the human mind brain and larger natural systems and the indeed the whole physical world um at, in which it's embedded and of which it is a product and um the human mind brain and i talked a little bit about this in the last um boston global forum meeting that we had uh, is an extraordinary development, literally and figuratively, and it is not how you would design things if you were just designing uh, artificial intelligence, for better or worse, and, and in both, I guess. Uh, it's lobes lopped upon top of lobes and phylogenetically preserved areas that are more primitive and higher order areas that are more advanced. And herein lies the delicate balance that we see played out every day in the world, um, for better or worse, again. And, um, and we would want to have developments that would magnify our better angels, as has been said, rather than our, our, uh, our demons. And so as a species, we have uh, both. We, we have the capacity for violence and polarization and hate. Um, we have the capacity for tremendous good and cooperation as social animals. And um, we have the capacity for higher order evaluation rather than reflexive action. And um, uh, just based upon emotion or let alone negative emotion, although emotion can really help us um, to shape our cognitions and, and our behavior at its best. And so the more we understand uh, the human mind, brain, and health and disease, the more we can lean towards the moral side, the executive side, if you will, the prefrontal uh, uh, side of our, uh, of our nature, the better. And the more, as um, our distinguished colleagues as part of this call have brilliantly articulated or developed, the more that AI uh, is in sync with natural laws of physics and the, um, the, the physical world, in addition to the biological national, uh, natural world, the better. And these two things can be combined, the human mind brain, and the physics and the natural world um, in, uh, in uh, theories and models like Carl Friston's free energy principle, which a number of people on this uh, Zoom also are, are familiar with and working on or in the context of and work of others as well, in which everything can be seen, almost literally everything, all complex systems or systems can be seen as um, uh, minimizing uncertainty and engaging in active inference or prediction. And, um, and that is a grand unifying model that allows um, uh, us to understand um, both the physical world and the natural biological world and within that context, the human mind brain uh, and uh, by extension, and for today's discussion, 
um, really AI and the development of AI by the human mind brain in the context of the biological natural world, in the context of a larger physical world. So other, in addition to just seeming harmonious, having said it like that, uh, it actually is harmonious in terms of the the laws and and if we uh, or or the 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 mechanisms of these systems, complex systems, and the more we understand them and can apply them for good, the more we're going to be able to um, to shape the development of AI in a way that benefits humanity rather than hurts humanity. So um, with that as a sort of introduction, I'll, I'll turn it back uh, to David and Tuan and and, um, and really look forward to hearing the, the discussion of these esteemed experts that we have today. Thank you very much, David, for starting us off. So I'd like to invite Alex Pentland, Director of MIT Connection Science and Professor at MIT to continue. Over to you, Alex. Great, thank you very much. Um, the uh, the energy principle uh, that you mentioned there, I think, is really a, a guiding principle for everything. It's been known for or hypothesized for a long time that uh, essentially all of biology is driven by that. Because indeed, if you can't predict very well, you're likely to be eaten by something. <laughs> and so there's a sort of basic driver there. Um, one thing I would sort of uh, pick a nit with is. Uh, there's this huge understanding about today's AI and transformer models. They're really just probability engines. Uh, and the best ones are built exactly on this energy principle. Now, they're bound by the current sort of training that they have. But uh, you see people, for instance, instrumenting robots for doing activities on an assembly line with vision and, and speech and touch. And, and that becomes very much like the sort of human condition where you have all these senses and you're trying to make things work. That, that lacks in the sense that it's not nearly as general. Uh, but uh, that type of approach, right, is I think undergirds all of the sort of successful things we see. It's just, I want to be very agnostic about the particular computational engine. Uh, right now, these LLMs seem to be all the rage. Uh, we just had a spin out from uh, MIT called Liquid Networks, which is be built on uh, C. elegans, uh, models of C. elegans uh, neurons, but they're models that are um, partial differential equations, right? And the striking thing is that for, for things that are physical things like navigation and stuff, whereas it might uh, take a transformer with 1.8 billion parameters, uh, uh, you get equivalent or slightly better pe behavior with 18 of these uh, uh, partial differential equation neurons. So it's order, I mean, <laughs> kind of like nine, 10 orders of magnitude less. And it works in many domains that have that sort of physical nature to them. And that's just one example. There are several things uh, that are happening now where rather than using the sort of stupid neurons that you see in transformer models today, you're using things that are closer to the science of it. Uh, and of course, not only do you get much more efficiency, but you get better generalization because actually it's capturing something about the physical world. So I love the idea of the general principle. I think that it's hard to argue against, but I would also argue that we need to look at a wide variety of mechanisms. Uh, uh, and the most exciting things in AI research at the moment, um, other than things like privacy and data provenance and those sort of practical problems, are the things of where do you put something like this in a reasoning engine? How do you make this something that has the reflective abilities that, that humans have? And, and particularly, how do you have um, reflective abilities that match the sort of things that people do. And, and we think that uh, in my group that the way you do that is look at interactions between people and how individuals integrate insights from other individuals. And if you treat the AI as 
another individual um, and follow the sort of integration rules that we have with people, um, then you get something where it's just part of the environment that it doesn't have agency. Uh, you still have the agency. And I know this is very quick, so you don't understand it. Uh, I'm not really laying it out. But um, uh, glad to see this happening. I just want to be a lot more um, free about exactly how we describe these sorts of processes. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Next, I'd like to invite John Klippinger, co-founder of Bioform Labs. Over to you, John. Well, thank you. I just want to make uh, thank Juan for organizing this and saying and being so in helpful in, in getting this letter out. Um, and we have uh, 1825 signatures. Um, and I think uh, David summarized the intent of the letter very, very well. Um, and I, I would like to add to that that the, the objective here in the sort of the combination of the Boston Global Forum with the Active Inference Institute, which does take a certain perspective on what it means to be sentient, alive, um, and it's sort of based upon the principles of physics, but also the idea of things reflecting upon themselves and being able to derive abstract models and being able to correct those models and make predictions based upon those models. That is the, the uh, sort of the essence of, of, of what it means to be alive. But we've been able to get signatories like Carl Friston, uh, uh, Michael Levin from uh, Computational Biologist. Uh, is doing extraordinary work in this. Um, and so we've been also to be able to reach to people in the policy world. This is what I think is so important is there's been such a disjuncture between the sort of technology and the science and the policy hmm. and they're being out of phase and the ability to integrate them because we're really coming up with a new framework, a new way of thinking about regulation with society is it's, it's, we're moving away from sort of an enlightenment mentality to an entanglement mentality. We're building a new notion of, of, of from the enlightenment to the entanglement. And that is a very different way of looking at the world and how things work and how to explain them. Um, and, I, and I'm of the view that uh, what you see in large language models and transformers, yes, they have billions of parameters and they are statistical engines. But from that, you can infer a certain causal structure, something like called Markov blankets that themselves are intentional and themselves be able to make representations. So we're, we're on the edge of a very different way of thinking about things, both from the science. And I think it really needs to be grounded in the science and not to be tied to the commercial interests of, of the, the Microsofts, the open AIs and others. So this is very, very important and make it a global platform involve people and companies around the world. Be that said, so this is a public good that we're creating. This is something that really should not be sort of captured by a particular set of commercial interests. And, and as has been in the past so many times, Sandy and I have worked on the whole area of digital identity and digital data and, and trying to develop policies around that. Um, and not entirely successful, certainly in the U.S. Um, and now we're moving into a much more powerful technology that has much more consequences. And I don't think we have yet understand the integration of the policy frameworks with the technology. Um, and so I think this is part of the creating that community that is 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 sort of versatile and and is can have these conversations uh across different disciplines is going to be essential and i think and i think unlike silicon valley we're not sort of captured to that, that that world i think we have an opportunity there's a to, to rethink it rephrase it there and and so I, I really look forward to being able to pull together the people to work together on this develop a common language of framework a new literacy on both the, the technology and the policy side of things to advance this. So I'll leave it with that. And thank everybody for their efforts in putting together the letter. I think it's well drafted. I think David did an excellent summary of it. And the question is what we do next. How do we get visibility? How do we change the public conversation by changing the public conversation commitment of resources to do this alternative framework? Thank you. Thank you, John. Next, I'd like to invite co-founder, CEO, and chief scientist of crowdsmart.ai, Tom Keeler, to say a few words, please. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for being uh, able to be part of this. Uh, and uh, thank you, Tuan, for organizing this. I think one of the uh, one of the founders as our, our original uh, members within the Boston Global Forum is Judea Pearl. 
And I'd like to uh, basically uh, uh, tap into his perspective on artificial intelligence, because I think one of the things that uh, is happening currently is we have a somewhat narrow view of artificial intelligence, which we've gotten very fascinated with the historical data that we've left behind and what we can learn from it. And that's really what the current large language models are about. They're taking our historical data and brilliantly generating a very interesting, plausible things out of that data. But that's only the very, very beginning. And uh, what Judea Pearl pointed out was we are more intelligent than our data. We have the capacity for imaginative thinking about the future and possibilities. And the other thing that we marry with that is the notion of collective intelligence. Together, we tend to be able to create things we cannot create alone. And the current AI models do not address how do we help people collaborate, work together, and amplify our collective ability to imagine future possibilities, to solve some of our toughest problems. The framework that's offered up by uh, systems like the free energy principle and active inference, which taps into the concept of adaptive learning, where you learn at every instance. You don't have to train a big model and then see what it does. We learn instantaneously. Uh, as we have experiences. In fact, this very, you know, intelligence is a shared thing. It is something that we constantly define together. And it's not captured in the current models. I, uh, the active inference framework allows that. And that's the sort of thing that I have personally been involved in for the last seven, eight years about applying the beauty of what comes out of the ability to uh, have a semantic, computational semantic space. And that's what the large language models have provided us to make meaning a computational thing right. we can do together. And we can do it together collectively. And in fact, it's possible for us to actually instantiate things like the scientific discovery method into how we interact. And I think this offers us a tremendous promise for taking AI forward. So I think rather than, and I think one of the wonderful things I love about this letter, we are not saying that all the progress that has been made so far is incorrect. We're actually saying that let's wrap around it. The intelligence that we had in together, we can co-create along with artificial intelligence agents, and we can create kind of an augmented collectiveness that is truly more intelligent than either machine or human alone. Uh, and I think the other things we want to embrace is nature itself has a way of self-learning. It's a, uh, it is a, the a very nature of life is a self-learning thing. Active inference captures that. And this notion of emergent self-learning is truly something that has its internals and in the physics of cooperative phenomena, something we observe in uh, the murmuring of, 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 of birds flying together. When, and you see that this cooperative phenomena is evident in nature. And active inference captures that very principle. So I think one of the things uh, is beautiful about this is it opens up an opportunity for research and work together going forward that I think can challenge uh, some of the bright young minds that are you know, graduating from universities today to, we, we have not finished with artificial intelligence at all. We're just at the very beginning of where it can go. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Tom, great points. I'd next like to invite former Acting Secretary of Commerce for the United States, Cam Carey, to say a few words, please. Um, uh, thank you, uh, and, and um, I'm glad to uh, to join you today. Um, I want to be clear that that you know, my participating in this this meeting is not an endorsement uh, of of the letter, uh, um, which I only received uh, yesterday. Um, 
or maybe I received it before, but uh, did not uh, get the chance to, to look at it. But um, there's a lot that I agree with. Uh, there's a lot that I think is very interesting, and there are areas uh, where, where I have questions. Um, but I think uh, where I, I fundamentally agree with uh, much of what's been said today is about sort of the limitations of where we are uh, today. Um, you know, the letter talks about uh, uh, you know, current models being corpus bound. Uh, uh, Sandy uh, talked about them as, as you know, basically probability engines. And, and you know, I think that that's, that's absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, Stuart Russell has has made the point that you know those models operate uh, you know, through uh, millions, billions of of iterations. Uh, on what a child of three uh, can do you know, on on you know, a, a single uh, digit number of iterations. Um, it seems to me that you know, what What's being talked about here, um, in some sense, uh, you know, to me, evokes what Marvin Minsky and company were doing uh, uh, sixty some years ago, saying, "If only we can figure out how humans process information, um, you know, we can we can build computers, uh, um, you know, that, that that can match that." And I think you know, we're talking about. Uh, trying to understand uh, the biological aspects of intelligence and import that uh, is is another version of, of that. I think, I, and and I think, to me, the important point here is is that that you know we are just beginning to really to to scratch the surface of. Of what's possible, and that you know, different, different, and more efficient, uh, um, and uh, uh, more inferential models uh, are uh, are something that's necessary. Uh, but John, you talked about uh, you know, trying to get to to sentience. Um, I think that's something that we need to be careful about. I'm sort of the school that. That said, look, let's not anthropomorphize these models uh, you know, because that I think can can lead to uh, false oh. confidence in, in AI, false assumptions about the capabilities of of the models, um, and you know I think in, in looking at at different kinds of Human computer interfaces. We need to remember that that uh, we in in replicating and understanding thought, understand thought, we also need to be careful. This is, you know, in some respects, is, you know, uh, replicating, uh, you know, in in a less intrusive way, Elon Musk's uh, implants um, for brain computer in, interface. Um, a lot of potential there, but also uh, a lot of risks. And I think in, in looking at these kinds of models, we need to be conscious of those. So, um, thanks for the inv invitation to, to be here today and, and to give a few remarks. Thank you, Cam. Next, I'd like to invite Professor of Political Science at MIT and faculty affiliate at the Institute for Data Science and society. Nazli Shupi, if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan, for organizing. And thank you, uh, those speakers that came before me, for uh, helping to clarify. I did not see the letter, so maybe the few comments I have to make sh um, may not be relevant. If they're not relevant, David will cut me off as graciously as he can. Okay? So there is a puzzle, a dilemma here that, that has to be resolved or address head on. It's implicit in what has been said. It has to do with time, temporality. Uh, it has to do with our multiple experiences with time, 
uh, we are accustomed to clock time, to budget time, etc. We have psychological time and we have uh, biological production of time space and we also have space time in the shadow of that of the physicists. We also know that time in decision making context, especially in stress context, becomes very, very collapsed, very uh, a collapse is the right word. Um, we also have a whole range of, of temporality. And what we don't have is, is a sense of matching temporal representation with either biological phenomenon or geological phenomenon uh, or conflict phenomenon or decision phenomenon. Um, so there's a homework to be done here that has to be worked out. The compression of time in decision making is what I wanted to draw your attention to. So we have a measurement of time issue, a measurement of meaning issue, and worrying about the agency side of it. What, when, and how. Voila, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Nasli. Excellent points. Next, I'd like to invite the director of the Institute of Future and Innovation Studies at John Cabot University, Francesco Lapenta, please. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So, um, nice to see everybody. Thank you to one for organizing this, and thank you for uh, preparing this uh, this uh, letter. I have only very few considerations. One of the reasons why I think the letter is important is because uh, we have learned that um, public debate is uh, normally, um, always a little bit behind uh, the uh, exploration of uh, science and uh, other uh, forms of uh, intellectual discovery uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. So one of the things that uh, I think the letter points out uh, really nicely is that there's already an existing body of reflections that is only being digested lately uh, by the broad public. So for this is something that someone that has worked in the field for a while will know. Uh, I've been uh, working, let's say, intensively in AI for 15 years, and it's been a long process of convincing and letting people see uh, what this body of work really is. So I think that the fact that we are moving forward, the link between the technology and the biological, uh, it's part of that conversation. It's a, it's a long-standing conversation that has already uh, over three decades. Uh, but it seems to be a miss uh, in the conversation of uh, uh, general AI. People and the public in general doesn't have a clear understanding of that literature and that conversation. And that the great merit of this letter is that is putting that agenda on the table. Uh, fundamentally, is saying don't look at AI just like any other technology. Uh, it's clearly something different. So it's something that we are spending a lot of time to convince people to use a different lens, people tend to see it in a very mundane way in what they can understand. All of a sudden, they, they understand chat GPT and, uh, and they think they understand artificial intelligence, but there's all this ginormous body of work uh, that is behind. There's no question in my mind that the challenges of the integration of AI with biology, cognition, and the other fields is the future. So if we can advance the conversation, uh, I think uh, we have to invest heavily into that. Uh, I would say that is the next stage. The two things that really need to be done, first of all, is a definition of artificial intelligence that that blends the technology with the biological and, and establishes a very clear uh, hierarchy between one and the other. So AI should be complementary for the cognitive, biological, physical qualities uh, of humanity and not the other way around. And the, the understanding of that connection uh, seems to be uh, very well uh, put forward in the letter. Uh, naturally, the letter has limitations um, in the phrasing and in the uh, perhaps uh, uh, the lack of question marks, meaning that a lot of the things that uh, that are described, I would put them as an agenda for uh, for things that need to be resolved. But as the great merit of uh, uh, stepping the conversation forward. So I'm really glad to participate in this uh, 
uh, amazing effort with so many talented minds that I know really well the history of AI and, and know how important and, and complicated it's going to be. So I think we, the letter is a, is a step ahead of the policy conversation I've heard so far, because um, I don't think it's uh, fully uh, formed, that part of the conversation. And this effort will contribute to make that knowledge more available. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Next, I'd like to invite the principal advisor on the digital transition for the European Commission, Paul Nimitz, to say a few words, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think our discussion is much, much richer uh, than the letter. Um, I liked in particular what uh, Tom Kehler said about um, the backwardness of today's artificial intelligence being based on yesterday's data and missing out on what drives really innovation and reform in modern free societies, uh, namely our imagination of the non-existent, uh, our discontent uh, with, with the present. And um, so I must say all these ideas, they are not uh, reflected in the letter. I'm also a little bit with uh, Cam Carey um, that I just don't know enough about this uh, methodology of um, active inst interference and what this institute does. I did read the letter before. I looked at the website of the institute. I, I don't understand whether it's part of a university, whether it's a private initiative and what it really um, adds to the work which is done in, uh, let's say, established academia. So uh, this being said, what I like about the letter is um, that it injects an element of uh, plurality and uh, a new approach, which one could conceive as more human. So an AI which is not anthropomorphized, but which is an intelligence which um, introduces exactly the safeguards on the one hand, uh, but also the drivers which uh, make humans act as social beings, which make humans act in democracy, hopefully. Um, uh, all of this, I think, uh, is important. Um, I have learned myself that, uh, you know, reading a, a, an introduction to psychology, that there are eight forms of intelligence uh, by Gardner. And um, so I, I share the doubts about uh, where we stand. I, I would say that we stand very much at the beginning of the development of this technology. And this technology throws us back also to think about what it means to be a human. And this is, um, this is where I want to end. Um, I would like to see a commitment among all of us um, and, um, and also in the letter, and I, I don't really see it, um, that we are in this not just uh, you know, to develop the greatest ever uh, technology which can do all the things which humans can do, but um, to maintain uh, the primacy of your humanity over technology, the primacy of de democracy over business models, and uh, to make sure that humans uh, never become the object of uh, total machine control, so that we never reach a stage uh, in which uh, we are being uh, the servants of technology rather than the other way around. I can live with the letter as it stands today, but if somebody wants to get, get the pen out and add a few words in this direction, I would be more happy. And uh, um, I would say in the future, in April or at another occasion, uh, we should um, uh, talk about the finality of uh, what we're doing here, actually. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next, I'd like to invite the program specialist at the Harvard Kennedy School, Dom Pham, to say a few words, please. Uh, hi, uh, it's always an honor for me to be a part of this wonderful discussion. Uh, I joined the meeting a little early, uh, so Tuant uh, jokingly told me that uh, right now, uh, Chinese uh, presidents, Chinese leaders, uh, is visiting Vietnam. And he asked uh, if I would like to meet uh, with Mr. Xi Jinping. Uh, I said yes. And uh, if I had a chance to meet with him, I would tell him two things. Uh, one is go back to China. <laughs> and, uh, 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 the second thing is uh, stop using AI to harm his own people. 
Uh, I think people like uh, Mr. Xi Jinping uh, remind us of how important the work of Boston Global Forum has been doing. Uh, I remember five, six years ago when I first got a chance to be a part of this wonderful discussion, uh, I was in awe uh, with the vision uh, and the enlightenment of uh, our uh, founders in here, uh, including uh, Professor Chukri. Uh, our number one goal at that time was to ensure uh, that there would be some international framework or regulation to ensure uh, what Mr. Paul Nemitz just said, uh, the primacy of humans over technology. Uh, and over the last few years, uh, AIs have made a lot of progress. Uh, and uh, uh, many other institutions and governments uh, have jumped on the train uh, of Boston Global Forum uh, regarding the need uh, to have some control, some oversight of technology. Uh, so I think the work of uh, Tuan and uh, of uh, all of us here uh, become more and more critical uh, to ensure that uh, human uh, will never be a servant of technology. Uh, and uh, uh, the last thing I'd like to add is that uh, Dr. Klippinger mentioned about uh, the framework of policy and technology. Uh, policy has always been much, much slower than technology. Uh, so therefore, uh, we need to keep in mind that if we could uh, speed up the train of policy uh, with the visions and the work of the Boston Global Forum, uh, maybe policy can catch up uh, with technology to ensure that technology will serve human beings. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nam. Next, I'd like to invite professor at the Pontifical Lateran University in the Vatican, Martin Kafu Kemkia, to please say a few words. And please unmute yourself, Martin. I had to mute you for background noise. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for including me in this uh, great platform, and uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure working on IE <clears throat> because very rec recently, I, I Tuam knows we we had I was in Boston with them and with David also, so we had to exchange in, in this issue regarding Africa. So I'm not going to comment on the on the letter on the on the document that you said, but to say what has happened already since then with the African side. So uh, I am a I am a stakeholder of the African the Association of African Universities from the diaspora European diaspora, and I already informed them on what we were planning to do with IE and, uh, with Boston Global Forum and all the stakeholders and members. And they were very, very happy because in fact, not even knowing that I was coming up with this proposal to them, they had organized and I participated not naturally, a webinar uh, on the role of artificial intelligence in the future of higher education in Africa, a complement or supplement to human efficiency. So this was a very important meeting that they they, which took place already in Africa. Uh, and, and I participated in that meeting and I informed there was it took place on the 29th of November. And I also just briefly informed them that we were working with, uh, with the Boston Global Forum to see how we can all participate in this age of IE. And in fact, they want really to participate with us. So, so my information here is not to make a comment or to, 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 to we will, we will associate in anything that is going on want to catch the train why it is still, still possible and then uh, work with you we we'll just have to formulate what how do we want to work with them we are here talking in we are talking of associations of african universities the most important uh, body that can exist in this sense who are really engaged in the sense that we are talking today so my mind is just telling you we are ready to work with you and many universities, not only one, in that case, we can use the association instead of using individual universities, we'll use the association of African universities to make a proposal to them. What do we do? What are we doing? 
what can we can what can we do together i think this is the for, for now this is enough uh, then we can see how to go ahead thank you thank you martin lastly i'd like to invite the co-founder and ceo of the boston global forum Thon Duen, to make a few closing remarks You're muted, Tuan. Before I conclude, I would like to invite our people here, say more, some any people would like to say some what more and discuss more a little bit, so uh, please. And uh, after that, I will conclude. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, Can go we yeah um I, I i realize that there's there's a lot of information compressed in that letter um and one of the notions of is this concept of active inference um needs a little clarification because there there's an emphasis on that and and where the origin of that goes related to paul's comment is that it it came from um started by carl christian who runs uh the welcome lab at, at university college london he's he's the most cited scientist in the world Two hundred seventy thousand citations he's a very very noted you can look him up and you do and he look at his many many lectures and he has a whole network uh very influential and in impact in neuroscience and physics and mathematics so this is not um it, it is a broader sort of science-based way of looking at uh, intelligences. It's not in, in, in biology. It's not a single thing. It's multiple things. And I think that, and I think there's a lot of uh, excellent work that's been done by Michael Levin, who's a signatory as well. And if you look at his work at, at um, in, in Tufts uh, at the Allen Discovery Center, Levin Labs, also at Harvard, the, the, the Wise Labs there. Um, so there is a new paradigm that's coming in. That's it's grounded in physics. Um, as Sandy noted, but it's also this concept of Markov blankets, Eugenia Pearl, uh, is a very respected notion of basically going from probability models to causal models. Now, the idea of, of, of consciousness and sentience, well, I was when I was referencing sentience, I was referencing what Carl would say, that to sense is to be alive, to the fact that you, he, 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 Instead of thinking, I, I think, therefore I am, I am, therefore I think. The fact that I am alive means I can sense and make predictions about the world. And that, that is the sense of, of sentience being in the sense of sensing and modeling the world in which you live. Um, and these are very different concepts that, uh, that and they sort of, I mentioned the difference between the enlightenment and, and the entanglement. There is you're moving from sort of classical physics to quantum mechanics, quantum information theory, which is a big shift, and you're and it is a different way, of, a different prism of looking at things. Plus, you're having a technology instantiation of these ideas through these powerful models, and so we're we're really at a mo and and this is where the the issue of how it affects humanity becomes really important because the technology, if, com if commercially pushed the way it is being pushed will have it will define it will it, it will define the conversation it'll define the, the policies i fear and so that's why i think a policy perspectives that are in, informed by the technology and the science are really important to pull these things together and have a human-centric and, and a life-centric life-centric perspective on these things and it be print and another way of looking at this kind of ai is principle based it's based upon as is, 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 is Tom was saying, it's the codification of a scientific process, really. And that becomes potentially a model for looking at democratic processes. So I'll, so I'll rest my, my agenda there. Well, then, so if I can jump in, I, I think, John, as I brought up the, the sentence, I, th I think what you said is, is very helpful uh, in terms of un understanding the meaning of what you're talking about. Uh, um, and I think uh, uh, you know, in addressing uh, some of the direction that models need need to take. I mean, I, I look at you know the challenges of robotics of autonomous vehicles today on on the track that we are going uh, with the the models. You know, taking as many iterations as as they do and needing as much data as they do. We are decades away from being able to datafy. Uh, you know the the entire environment. Uh, well, can I, but I, I, you know, 
I mean, but what you are talking about is you know, yeah. different pathways yes. of getting of understanding that that information and you know that 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 I think is an important point. Exactly. Point. Exactly. Thank you. Who else? <laughs> Okay, if um, no one else, uh, I would like to say a few words. Thank you so much for your joining and discussion. Uh, today is a very uh, special day at Boston Global Forum. It is the birthday, 11th birthday, December 12, 2012. And uh, we have new initiative with uh, the letter and uh, and so Boston Global Forum will support and contribute for this initiative and letter and endorse for the letter. And uh, thank for John Klippinger, uh, Tom Killer, and David Simberwe. They are, they, you are very interested and key for the letter and for this initiative. And uh, also, we are, I think that is stuck and we will do every month uh, one uh, round table on this card update we will do with the two or uh, three parts the first that is science technology uh, application with a concept for AI assistance how apply it and how do and I inform you very good uh, news that either uh, there are some university in Vietnam they very engaged and one very exciting I have chance to meet that is the uh, uh, information and communication university of the military and uh, ministry of defense of Vietnam. They really, really enjoy with uh, the very, very interested with our ideas letter and they will do, they have the center, uh, cybersecurity and AI <coughs> and the very big, uh, investment from Ministry of Defense for this center. So they would like to engage and work with us to develop this initiative and letter. So uh, very good news and we will have chance to work with them more. And of course, India, Amrita University, they join with us very much. And uh, we hope our, we will join to, <coughs> yeah, that is our AIWS roundtable of the ZIP initiative and letter. And we will improve and we will add more as uh, your comment, as uh, Kerry and Nasri Chukri and our people here <coughs> today. And uh, please uh, note that April 30, we have a very big conference for whole day conference at uh, Lope House University uh, and uh, not only uh, science technology we need to uh, another that pop group policy and, <clears throat> and uh, we will do that and uh, under the, the section a group and another that the third group that the public engagement and <clears throat> speech uh, because uh, uh, we uh, work very much with uh, spiritual leaders and religious figures from <clears throat> many religions and they are very support and interested our work our initiative AIWS and a special letter and uh, <clears throat> we will organize a conference and event how to bring spiritual values for this because you know human and uh, the people joy and connect and work with computers uh, physics and spiritual values from people also that means we will do that for this initiative also and I like I get support very much from our meetings with spiritual leaders in Europe, in Asia, and uh, also in 
many relations. And thank you for Martin <coughs> to support, to connect, and we will do very much, and Martin contributes very much for uh, religion and spiritual values and leaders. And that is the, our work so far, and very honored to work with you and uh, work with our many contributors and on very special and historical day of Boston Global Forum. Uh, we are very honored and grateful to thank for great contribution from your great contributions. I think <coughs> all of you today have great contribution for Boston Global Forum for a long time. And a very dear friend and distinguished contributors. Boston Global Forum have very achievement and result and contribution for the world that is from you. And we have highly appreciate your support, contribution, and hope and believe you will join with us and contribute more, more in next years. And thank you so much. Thank you for your joining and hope our the letter, the letter and initiative will come to and happen in our community, in our global enlightenment community. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye to all. Thank nice you. to see you. Bye. Very thank good. Bye-bye. Wish bye -bye. you the best. Okay. Thank you, David. See you in Boston soon. Yes. yes. We hope uh, we're, we're here.